we're going to talk about TMS in particular, the plan for a clinical and clinical research program here in TMS. And oh, the big picture point is what we will do that's unique and uh, what sort of is the appropriate kind of clinical use of this intervention. So I'm going to start with a very brief overview. Um, this is a picture of a person getting TMS with one of a number of the kind of devices available. And the that arm thing has at the end of it a figure of eight coils. So if you look down on it, if, if, if that woman who was receiving it looked up, she would see an eight or an infinity sign, basically. And um, that is one of the kinds of TMS, as you will appreciate in a moment, there are others. But first, what is this thing? So it is a means of applying a focal magnetic stimulation uh, to a person's brain, hopefully, and it is triggered by a coil of wires through which a very brief pulse of current, electrical current is passed. So this is the basic principle of electromagnet. If you spend, send a changing magnetic uh, uh, electric, uh, to change a, a brief uh, changing electrical impulse through a wire that changes direction, it creates a magnetic field in the, uh, that will be running perpendicular to that set of coils. So it'll be going towards the head. Um, and the reason this is of value to us, like everybody knows you can stimulate people with what would be considered electrical stimulation. That is, you, you think in terms of applying a voltage to a person's head or delivering current to a person's scale. The reason that this is a big advantage is because those electric stimuli get tremendously affected by this skull, scalp, and CSF. So you cannot deliver anything focal to the brain. So ECT is not a focal stimulus. It's a very broad stimulus. Um, and even if you put the electrodes with ECT very close together, you cannot stimulate the underlying tissue with any specificity. The same is true of the uh, transcranial direct current stimulation, which is a, a, a form of electrical stimulation that unlike ECT doesn't elicit seizures. It's a sub-threshold stimulus, sub-seizure threshold stimulus. So here we have the advantage that the magnetic field passes through that tissue, skull, scalp, and CSF unimpeded. It, has, it is not affected at all because it's not ferromagnetic. It, it's not, it doesn't have a magnetic properties that would impact that magnetic field. And by ha a changing magnetic field then induces currents. And that is what happens in the brain is that it's a way to trigger electrical currents in the neurons underneath the coil. So you give a brief pulse of magnetic uh, field, and then you get this currents in the, in the brain, and that is what we're trying to achieve. The hope is that this can be done in a relatively focal way and uh, target a particular area of interest. Its limitation is that it's not very deep. So the magnetic field falls off very rapidly. I think it's one over the cube of distance. So it falls off very rapidly so that you can really only hope to get superficial cortex stimulated. So you can't stimulate the thalamus. You can't stimulate the um, amygdala. It's just not possible with this intervention. But the logic is that by stimulating a cortical region, you get transsynaptic stimulation of other areas. That is, you activate cortical neurons, they activate other area neurons, and that allows you to stimulate regions below the cortex. This is done in uh, a range of stimulus frequencies. So you give pulses as slow as one every two seconds and as fast as, I guess, 60 hertz uh, would be the, the highest end currently. And a person would sit through a treatment session where they would receive a, a let's say if you were doing a half hertz stimulus, a half hour train of these half hertz stimuli. Or if you're doing, let's say, 10 hertz stimuli, you would get a series of trains of 10 hertz stimuli with little breaks in between that would last like around a half hour total. So one very, very important point I want to make is that there's a tremendous misunderstanding in the world about the nature of TMS. 
you will hear people in research and clinical context say things like, TMS works or TMS doesn't work. The problem is that statement is that TMS is a family of interventions. It's not one. It's like saying psychotherapy works or psychotherapy doesn't work, right? What kind of psychotherapy are you doing? You know, and, and what are the details of that? You need to know those details to really understand what you're talking about. So the question of whether TMS in general works is a, not a relevant question. Are there forms of TMS that are effective and help people clinically? That's a more relevant question, and what are those forms? I just wanna quickly review what are the basic parameters of the TMS thing, a treatment that vary so that you get a sense of sort of what the landscape is. One is dosing. So people dose TMS in a very practical way. We unfortunately can only benchmark it to a level of magnetic field uh, applied that elicits a neural response in an individual because there's so much variation among individuals in terms of the distance of brain from the uh, scalp and other fa excitability factors so that there's no universal dosing. For everybody, we try to figure out how much is necessary to elicit a response and there's only one way to do that and that's you take advantage of the motor cortex which is something where, that you can stimulate and elicit something you can see. So you stimulate a region of a person's motor cortex, let's say that makes, controls hand movement, and then you see a movement of the hand and you know you've stimulated at a threshold high enough to trigger activation of the motor cortex. So that has been the basis of how we dose. And people dose some degree above or below the, the amount of magnetic field strength necessary to achieve a response in a muscle, either as measured by visual, uh, uh, confirmation of movement or electromyographic measurement of the voltages produced in the muscles. So, um, and, us and so the, it's usually these two, one of these two muscles, abductor pollicis brevis or the first interosseous digitalis so in the hand. So that's one key attribute. Another key attribute is the position of the coil. Where are you going to stimulate? Where are you going to put it on the head? What's your target region? And uh, that can, is going to matter greatly and people are trying to target often a brain region based on something related to things you can measure on the scalp and the, the ways they do that matter greatly. So the simple, most simplistic one, which it was, it was a pretty weak way to do it, was done in uh, the first sort of big double blind or sham controlled trial, the initial neuronetics trial that led to FDA approval of that form of therapy, they found the motor cortex spot that led to thumb movement basically, and then they moved five centimeters anterior of that and with the hope that that was over dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Well, everybody's head size is different. What five centimeters on a person's scalp is almost no meaning with respect to their brain, and it doesn't make sense. You can use other scan skull landmarks that are known to be relatively over certain regions, and that's another way people do it, by measuring different uh, parts of the skull and you know, orienting to that. And even better, and, and, and that's one of the things we are doing, is you take an MRI scan with a marker on top of the scalp so you can tell where things are on the scalp, and then you actually register your TMS to a position that you know is gonna be over that region. So, and pretty much everybody for depression, and I'm mainly focusing on discussing depression, has used the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex as their target location. I think that was largely accidental initially, or a vague ballpark guess, but it has tremendously influenced the field, and most of the work has been done there. Now, this is based on the idea that, as I mentioned earlier, that if you stimulate the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, that's where the coil is there, that you are gonna affect transsynaptically some interesting areas of the brain like anterior cingulate, medial prefrontal cortex, things like that. And sort of that's how uh, people have justified the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex location, though I, I think it's been, uh, was originally less theory driven than this, less systematically done. Another key attribute is what is the frequency of the stimulus? As I mentioned, the range can go from a half hertz up to 60, usually it's between 0.5 and 20. In the low frequency range, that is you do a pulse, and then you wait a second, you do another pulse, it's thought that that frequency of stimulus actually relatively preferentially activates GABAergic neurons, and 
there as a result enhances some inhibitory processes. Now it's not fair to say that that in inhibits brain tissue generally because sometimes it activating GABA neurons leads to disinhibition can act can lead to some regions being activated but the idea here is it's thought to primarily uh, activate those GABA interneurons in the cortex and higher frequency stimuli just based on the physical properties of these neurons uh, tends to relatively preferentially activate glutamatergic neurons in the cortex so there tends to be activation but that can lead to inhibiting of areas of the brain through transsynaptic means another key attribute is the coil shape so there are many different kinds of coils, and coil design is in active area research. Um, the standard one that was used is a figure eight coil because it's relatively focal among the choices. But there's, you know, an endless series of possibilities. The really only two, three out there that are being used to any significant degree is the figure eight coil, and sometimes the the two halves of it are bent. Uh, but so it's it's kind of like the uh, an eight broken, you know, bent in the middle. And then there's an iron core uh, version of the figure eight coil, which has iron in the center of it, which is perhaps somewhat deeper. And then there's the H coil, which is uh, in the brain sway device that has uh, all, one of the FDA approved devices that is a re very broad stimulation. And people have argued that, well, why are we doing broad stimulation when isn't the whole point of this to be focal? Well, it turns out Broad st all of the treatments that we know about in psychiatry that work well for depression in particular tend to be broad. We don't really have great examples of being able to do anything focally that works really well. Hopefully we will in terms of deep brain stimulation models, but a lot of that work so far has led to negative outcomes when people have put their nickel down on one spot and said, that's where we have to go. So the question of focal versus broad is actually yet to be answered. And is a, it may be that broad is helpful because you hit, uh, you're more likely to hit important areas, but at the same time you think it would maybe undermine benefit, but that doesn't so far seem to be the case. Um, just a few more points and then I'll wrap up. When do we use TMS clinically and what, are the ba what is the basis for it? So um, there have been a lot of studies carried out over the years. The most of them have been carried out with major depression. And, but these studies vary tremendously. I'm just gonna show you a quick look at some of the initial studies. I obviously I don't mean to you, for you to get any of the detail here, only to point out that you'll see that these, a whole bunch of these were carried out at left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, um, that they almost all used figure eight coils, and but they had differences in terms of the frequency of stimulation and the dosing primarily. So the stimulus intensity is 80 to 100 percent, 110 percent, and the stimulus frequency is uh, uh, here. I've only showed the ones in the higher range, but they're 10 to 20 percent. Here's some more trials um, in similarly used uh, methods that were comparable. On the other hand, there were a bunch that used that did low frequency. And they went at, some of these went in different areas like right prefrontal cortex and um, they're uh, all though at the low frequency range with the idea that in some er situations you might want to more activate the GABAergic neurons and might want to go with a lower frequency as opposed to others where you might want to stimulate the glutamatergic neurons. So that's kind of the vague theory that was applied that led to some of these decisions. We have different forms of TMS that have been approved with different indications because the way the FDA has handled this is that they have accepted applications for devices and with certain parameters, which makes sense given the fact that not all TMS is the same. The FDA follows what I think is a very reasonable process and says we aren't going to give one approval for TMS. It is device and method specific. So I have little pictures of the differences between these, but these are the um, seven that I believe have FDA approvals right now for psychiatric indications. There's a Neuronetics device on the, on the top there, which, uh, which uh, look, it has a figure of eight coil and, a, um, and slight variants thereof, and they're approved for depression. We have here a MagVenture device. That's the second one down. You can see it sort of on the right hand side there. Um, it, also a similar kind of structure. A very different one is the H coil, that one that's very broad and it looks like an old fashioned hair dryer. And 
it fu functions in a pretty different way. Um, it's a, it, 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 it's a, got its own specific methods for how you affix it to the head and so on. And then there's a mag stim device, Apollo, Cloud, Uri and Ura, which is for my brain. Um, and you can see the Brainsway device is also approved for OCD. This is a issue in process. New efforts are made are being made to get approvals for PTSD and other kinds of things, and you're going to see that emerging over the near future. Just want to mention one last thing. What are the most important side effects of the treatment? Well, it was. Uh, an <coughs> important thing that this was a subthreshold stimulus when it emerged in contrast to ECT, which greatly changes the risk. There's no anesthesia involved, which greatly changes the risk. But uh, it's not a replacement for ECT. It is, I'd say, clearly less effective as currently performed. Maybe in the future it'll be as or more effective. Methods are rapidly evolving. The most concerning risk is seizure induction, which is extremely rare, particularly when you follow safety guidelines. But it is a ra very rare, though, important side effect. Headache is the most common thing, and stimulation site pain. There's been some concerns about hearing impairment because the stimulation sounds kind of loud. It's like a bang, bang, kind of like that. And so people use ear protection generally, though there's been very, very few cases of, of hearing problems. But uh, one key point is there's not been any evidence of cognitive impairment so far, greatly differentiating it from ECT and, and some other possible options. So I'm going to stop there and pass it over to Catherine. Uh. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so Andrew talked about the background of TMS and why this therapy is important. Um, I'd just like to add that he was one of the pioneers in, in performing TMS and developing this as a treatment very early on at Duke, so we're very fortunate to have him here and helping to develop this program. So over the past two, about two years, we've been working to set up a TMS clinic and service in, here at UCSF. So I'm going to talk about TMS at UCSF and the process and vision of, of this clinic. So the core message here today is that TMS is an important part of UCSF psychiatry. So I'm gonna show that um, bringing TMS to UCSF will fill an unmet clinical need. It will fill an educational gap for residents and medical students, and it will also allow us to bring novel um, techniques to advance our understanding of the pathophysiology underlying depression. So Andrew showed evidence that TMS is effective and a good option for treating patients with depression. Nationally, institutions, top psychiatry institutions have embraced this idea, both using TMS in its clinical form, but also as a tool for advancing our understanding of psychiatric disease. So all of the top um, programs have TMS services and, and neuromodulation centers, except for UCSF. <laughs> So you can see nationally TMS is being used to treat depression and here at UCSF we also think that our patients would benefit from TMS. Um, as we know many patients are inf insufficiently treated with pharmacology and TMS can provide an alternate solution for these patients. So what sets our clinic and our vision for this clinic apart from other clinics? Um, so here in Northern California most of TMS is delivered in private clinics. Um, this limits access to treatment for those who do not have um, coverage that uh, will allow them to get access at these private clinics. So our clinic will be able to provide additional opportunities for care through broader coverage and through research opportunities. Um, our current clinic also houses a, um, really cutting edge equipment, as, as Andrew mentioned. Um, it's not TMS itself, but what type of TMS care that you're delivering. And so by having this advanced technology and the, and the most advanced treatments, we'll be able to deliver better TMS care with capabilities beyond what's being offered. Um, we'll also be able to treat patients that were not eff um, effectively treated in private clinics and perhaps even partner with these clinics to treat very difficult cases. In addition, because we're part of a research institution, a large healthcare system, we'll have the opportunity not only to deliver TMS care, but to advance 
TMS standards of care through um, different research programs. For example, people at Stanford are testing out accelerated TMS, and which is proving to be very effective for patients and will be able to engage in some of those research projects. Um, and then finally, we'll be able to advance treatment through collaborations with other departments. That is an impossibility in private care. For example, we've already talked with people in the radiology department and um, patient, people in the neurology department about different projects um, that will help us advance care uh, for additional indications. So I'll step back now and talk a little bit about the um, process of developing the clinic itself. Um, this is the approximate timeline. Um, Andrew and I first um, worked on developing the business plan about two years ago. Um, and since that time, um, you know, we've identified a site, established funds, um, purchased the equipment. Um, we've had the CPT coded codes added to the insurance contracts at UCSF and the reimbursement rates have been negotiated. We've developed TMS technician roles and hired technicians. Um, we've done site visits to other TMS clinics to understand their process and flow, including UCLA and Stanford, and developed all the um, necessary safety and consenting and medical form forms. We also created a new DEP that will house TMS um, and then set up the APEX, um, both referral and templates and smart phrases for TMS. Um, so the, temp the estimated start date now, we're very excited, will be August 30th or shortly after. So of course, there's been a whole team that's helped make this happen and I'll highlight Eva and Sarah who's sitting here in the audience. Um, as well as the other people listed here. Rebecca Martinez is our excellent TMS technician that we recently hired. Um, she just um, worked, finished a master's using T TMS as a treatment tool. Um, and then, of course, Andrew and Matt for the vision and, and funding for the clinic. So here's our clinic. Um, I'll in, um, that we, as I mentioned, we have um, state-of-the-art equipment that allows us to deliver very innovative and personalized care. We have the MagVenture machine, as Andrew mentioned. Um, this is Rebecca holding one of the coils. Um, we have the MagPro X100, which is an advanced high performance um, stimulator that offers a large choice of stimulation parameters, including all the standard parameters and theta burst, um, and has research capabilities. So most centers just have a TMS device. Um, unlike that, we also have a neural navigation device, this T Localite TMS Navigator. And as Andrew mentioned, um, this allows us to deliver targeted and personalized TMS. So um, what's shown up at the top is the detector or the camera. Um, and this detects um, the location of the coil. And you can see there's a little three-prong um, device on the on the coil that Rebecca is holding and then we also put one of those detectors on the patient's head so in this way we can build a real-time loop among the doctor the TMS device and the patient so we can um, display in real time the location of the TMS device and the delivery of treatment so you can see here we can incorporate the patient's own MRI um, and then we can map or target in our planning stage um, the exact target we want to um, stimulate in the prefrontal cortex or another target where we select. We can also place grids over the motor cortex so we know exactly where we want to stimulate to determine the dosing, where we have stimulated, and the angle of our coils. All of this can be recorded and we can pull it up the next time the patient comes. So why is this important? Like Andrew said, it's the type of TMS that matters, not only just that you're delivering TMS. So, um, and typically when, pay, when research studies have shown that when you're just guessing where the DLPFC is located, you don't do as well. And here's a study that showing, shows there's a 10 point improvement after four weeks if you use targeted um, uh, TMS, image guided TMS. So what's the clinic workflow? This slide is busy, um, but I'll, what the process is is that a, a physician would refer their patient to the TMS clinic. Um, then Rebecca would contact the patient and get a, a bunch of history from them. She would then contact the insurance company to go through the pre-authorizations. At that point, the patient would uh, schedule an appointment with me or Andrew, and we would evaluate um, whether they're a good candidate for TMS. 
Um, and if they are, um, they will have two types of two appointments. The first is an appointment where we determine the target and dose of the TMS. Um, that's called the motor thresholding appointment. And then after that, um, they would start treatment and they would typically receive about 20 to 36 days of TMS in a row. So you do it for five days a week um, for um, 20 to 36 treatments. This is what a patient's experience in the TMS clinic might be. So once we have evaluated that they're a good candidate, um, you, we will take brain measurements um, in line with some of the older methods for selecting the target. You can see we have the instrument placed on his forehead here. Um, it's small, but you can sort of see in the second picture. This um, localizes the patient's head in space. And then we have this pointer instrument that allows us to take measurements on the patient's head, which is then detected. And so we can warp the patient's um, brain and the patient's head structure to either a common MNI template or to the patient's own MRI. So you can see in this planning stage, we have the patient's MRI, we have our target selected um, on top of the MRI, and then we are able um, to place targets exactly where we would like them to be. So after that, we would do the motor thresholding. The purpose, again, is to determine the stimulation dose. Um, we can't see an output when stimulating over the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, um, so we use visual output from stimulation over the motor cortex as a proxy to infer dose based on this motor response. So what we do here is we set um, the amplitude of stimulation to around 70%. We deliver biphasic pulses along where we think the motor cortex is in a grid-like pattern, and then so find the highest response, um, uh, the highest motor response. So we, in this clinic, will use EMG to do that. So you can see he has EMG um, on his hand right here. Then we reduce the threshold and find um, the amplitude, reduce the amplitude until we find the minimum amount of stimulation required, and that's the, the motor threshold. So here's, this is the motor thresholding coil. You can see we have that device on there as well. So we can watch on the computer screen as we deliver the TMS pulses exactly where we are. Then we shift over to the treatment coil, which is a heavier and cooled coil, um, and to deliver treatment. So the patient rests comfortably in a chair and will receive the, the treatment. Um, it lasts about 40 minutes. Um, there are also new paradigms now um, that recently received uh, approval. Intermittent theta burst stimulation is a very quick three minute protocol that has proved to be just as um, effective as the longer protocols. So Andrew talked about the safety I'm going to mostly skip through that. Um, these, uh, this is a very safe procedure. Side effects are fewer than um, with standard medications often. The concerning um, side effect that is rare are its seizures. And so the contraindications for care are generally those um, disorders that would increase your th seizure threshold. So heavy alcohol use, um, brain tumor, things like that. Um, TMS also has a magnetic field strain similar to MRI, and so the other contraindication is metal in the head, which can be dangerous. So um, any metal in the head, pacemaker, cochlear implants, is also a contraindication to treatment. We have an AED um, in the clinic on one of those shelves right next to the computers that you saw. Um, we also have put in place safety and training protocols, and we have trained physicians and technicians that perform the therapy. So how do you refer a patient to TMS? We now have a website that you can go to. It talks a lot about TMS. It has information sheets for patients. It has a referral order that you can um, fill out and then send to us uh, as an email. We also have all of the, pa the forms that patients will need to fill out um, as part of their pre-screening process. Um, so you can check those out. Um, also, uh, once the clinic goes live, we have an APEX order. So anyone within UCSF who wants to um, refer a patient to TMS would use the APEX TMS order, which is very similar to the ECT order. 
So in addition to the clinical goals of the clinic, we also have educational goals that are important. Um, Andrew and I have a senior elective for residents um, that will begin this January. Um, Lucas Broster is the first resident who will do that. Um, this is a longitudinal six months elective where um, residents will come in and learn about how to select patients and how to deliver TMS treatment. There are also research opportunities for residents and medical students. There is opportunity to bring in outside speakers in TMS, um, which is additional learning experiences for residents. And finally, we have an interventional area of distinction here at UCSF that's has increasing interest. I was just at the dinner the other night and there were over 20 residents who came, which is the largest showing. So this will provide um, another site. Um, we offer um, both TMS as well as other neuromodulation, so programming for deep brain stimulation there um, and mentorship. And in particular, um, there's fewer women in interventional psychiatry, so that's another important um, area. So now I'm gonna switch gears and finish up with a very brief discussion about the research goals of the clinic. Andrew and I have been part of a collaborative program with the neurosurgery department to develop novel neurotechnology for brain therapies. So I did my fellowship with Andrew and Eddie Chang here who was a leader of the um, Subnets program. So this program is a large multi-institutional program that has the goal of um, achieving an unprecedented understanding of how brain circuitry goes awry in refractory neuropsychiatry psychiatric illness um, and then to develop new technologies to treat these disorders. So the, all of this program has been based on intracranial recordings in patients with epilepsy who also have comorbid depression. So main um, study highlights through the Subnets program were the identification of novel stimulation targets, the orbital frontal cortex that modulated mood, um, novel state markers of mood, particularly anxiety, and the ability to decode mood from neural signals. And my contribution to this program has been to identify a resting state trait marker of depression. This is different from a mood state marker. So um, we, the potential here is to um, use this information to drive and track novel stimulation paradigms um, for psychiatric disease. So here I'm showing um, a full brain model of intracranial activity, time series activity, across a large group of patients. Uh, machine learning was applied to this model to identify markers that could discriminate patients with over 80% accuracy. We've then um, performed hierarchical clustering on the biomarker features to identify two biomarkers of depression. Um, you can see these as these two colorful blocks here and this purple group and the blue group. Each of those markers represented different circuits related to depression um, that were described by their connectivity profile and the spectral power across those circuits. So now our research goal is um, threefold. One is to develop non-invasive correla correlates of these invasive biomarkers and leverage um, all of the research that has been done in an intracranial setting over the past five years. Um, so we um, are in the process of um, combining um, and proposing a study where we'll collect fMRI um, and perform DTI and, and resting state imaging together with EEG analyses to um, find these correlates non-invasively in com combination with TMS stimulation and also identify new biomarkers of treatment response. A second goal is to develop novel treatment paradigms. So TMS leads to increased cortical excitability at 10 hertz um, and LTP. Circadian rhythm mo uh, modulates LTP and cortisol has a distinct circadian rhythm and also inhibits LTP. So we want to test whether time of day influences treatment response. A third goal is to understand the effect of TMS on MDD networks, and this is getting at the idea of better understanding the physiology underlying depression. Um, so for example, we're embarking on um, a, a, a clinical trial of deep brain stimulation in, in major depression, and we'll have the opportunity to record um, from temporary electrodes in several areas of the brain. So if we apply TMS-like pulses to some of those electrodes, we can measure the network effects of that type of stimulation across brain networks. 
So these are just some of the ideas for the research that will allow us to really advance um, our understanding of depression and how we, what TMS is doing and how we can um, make, develop better TMS treatments. So finally, this is our, um, you know, we're starting small. We have one treatment room, two faculty. Um, we've been um, TM looking at um, the TMS Center at UCLA. Uh, Andrew Luchter there has been extremely supportive of our program development. They started in the same way we were 10 years ago. They now have six treatment rooms, seven faculty, and 5,000 treatment sessions per year. So we hope that over the next five years, we'll be able to expand to provide better access to care for patients, perform novel research, collaborate across departments to advance TMS treatments, and develop collaborations with other programs to advance TMS therapy. So I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Ramotze. I first met Ramotze um, during my fellowship when I was working with him at the TMS Health Solutions. So he's one of the faculty that we hope to um, bring into the clinic as we expand. Um, and um, he's since joined the faculty here and is going to talk about his experience in, um, in delivering TMS treatment to patients in the private sector. Thanks for that introduction, Catherine. <clears throat> so I'm going to try to go fast so we have some time for questions. This is a clinician's perspective on TMS. I first kind of got trained in TMS in 2015 and then started actually using it as a treatment modality in 2016. No disclosures. And so I thought, well, what, what might you want to ask uh, or what might your patients ask you? And so I put together these questions. What's the variability of treatment response? What's the durability of TMS treatment? Can patients be successfully treated with TMS alone, so TMS monotherapy? And then what about concomitant alcohol use? So moving right along, responders, non-responders, and remitters. So this is about variability in TMS response. And in the TMS world, there are sort of like two, two big numbers that come up. 50% of patients respond, and about 33% of patients remit. And just try to keep those numbers in your head. 50% response, 33% remission. And this is work that was originally done in a study level four type population, so severely treatment resistant, who you would not have got those kinds of response or remission rates with another medication. So 50% response, which also means 50% non-response, and 33% remission. What do we see in the literature? So there was this really interesting study uh, published in Nature Medicine in 2016 by Drysdale, senior author Connor Liston, and they developed a method to find depression, what they call biotypes. Basically, they put together HAMD with functional connectivity neuroimaging and came up with four discrete groups of patients, which they called imaginatively biotype one, two, three, and four. You see it in panel A over there. Uh, and what they found was that the biotypes had differential responses to TMS treatment. So biotype one had as much as an 80% treatment response to TMS uh, biotype 3 had a 6, so biotype 1 is the blue, uh, in graph A. Uh, fuchsia would be biotype 3, had about a 60% response, and the other two biotypes had pretty low TMS responses. So when we say 50% res response to TMS and 33% remission, what's probably happening is that we're smushing together really super responders and really poor responders, and we're, we're getting this average. And so there has been a lot of discussion in the field about ways in which we could refine selection or maybe treatment target to, to get more patients better. So my own experience, uh, I worked with a private group. I presented the next couple of slides in a prior Grand Rounds on the East Coast. But when I worked with this group, so this is a large private sector group that does a lot of TMS. Um, and uh, this is a poster that had been produced collaboratively with uh, Jesse Bastians when he was here. And I just want to draw your attention to the, there's a graph in the middle on the bottom, and we're going to do a blow up of that in a moment. 
long story short about the population that we were treating. Um, so this group collected an outcomes repository, and really this is also a plug for like how you collect your data and what you can do with it, and as your clinic grows, how much can come out of it. So at five practice sites, and most sites have two machines, but some had more, um, 782 patients were treated over a 30-month period. Um, this was TMS as an adjunct, and uh, PHQ-9s were collected as a primary outcome measure. Uh, with thresholds being 50% decrease in PHQ-9 means you've responded, and if your PHQ-9 is less than four, you have remitted. And secondary measures were GAD-7, Montgomery, Asperg, Depression Rating Scale, and the CGI severity measure, CGIS. Um, quick view of this slide. So at the top we have mean age, 47.5 years, and um, 63% of the patients were female. I'd like to just draw your eyes quickly to the number of antidepressant trials, which is the second to last blue box. And you'll see that the lion's share of patients were in the four plus antidepressant trials. So we're talking a STAR-D level four patient population. And uh, well, what was the outcome? Well, uh, fourth bullet down. 50% of patients were responders and 30% achieved remission. So very similar to what I told you that has been seen over and over again in the field. Uh, but let me show you the graphs from that. So um, the green line shows the total subjects and we're seeing the PHQ-9, whoops, going from about an 18 to about a 10. So not great, less than a 50% response. But if you just chose the responders, which is the blue curve, what you see is they're doing really well. They're almost reaching remission. Whereas if you look at the red curve for non-responders, not much change at all in PHQ-9. And um, different groups have looked at this in more detail. Some actually have a bimodal distribution for responders, but you really do see this vastly different kind of curve for responders versus non-responders. Uh, so that's some of what I have to say about variability in response. Um, some patients will respond to TMS really well, and I should probably go back and show one more thing about this. So look at the blue curve, and you see we're checking PHQ-9s at 10, 20, 30 um, sessions, and then the end of treatment. Usually by session 10, if you compare responders with non-responders, you have a statistically significant difference. So you really get early indication about whether somebody's responding. Uh, I just wanted to show you the four outcome measures all put on um, the same graph and point out one thing. So the GAD7, the anxiety measure, you notice it's the only one that's not improving at session 10. First, it's getting worse. Uh, TMS often causes anxiety in patients. So an important thing to talk to patients about is how anxiety might actually get a bit worse at the start. Um, question of durability, will it last? So the old paper that was used as the reference on this is the Dunner study from 2014. It was a naturalistic design and they looked at durability of benefit over one year of follow-up for patients who had received TMS. And uh, long story short, um, 62.5% of patients met response criteria um, during the whole one year follow up period, which is, which is a good bet. And um, what we see from these graphs here, so the circles on the bottom, that's the graph for respond for remitters. And uh, basically, they, most remitters remained remitters over a one year follow up period. There was the possibility of reintroduction of TMS if somebody was um, becoming worse in this study. Uh, responders who are the triangles remained responders, and then the top two um, lines are for partial responders and non-responders. So patients seem to maintain their profile uh, over follow-up, but a majority of patients maintain their response. So that was the old durability data we had for TMS. Uh, there have been enough studies like this for there now to be a meta-analysis of durability uh, published by um, probably the most known name on this paper is Alvaro Pasquale Leone, who's there from the start. Uh, 
there were 19 studies that met eligibility criteria. They had enough data from 18 of them to get durability up to six months, and then enough data from nine of them to get durability up to one year. And what they found was that with TMS, you're getting durability uh, to the level of responder rates of 50% up to one year after a successful in induction course of treatment. So that's, that's pretty good uh, durability, better than ECT. Now, that might raise the question, well, what else can we do maybe to make TMS durability better? So there's this interesting paper published by Martin Arns' group. Um, and what they did is simultaneous TMS and psychotherapy. So literally, patient in the chair under the magnet and a psychotherapist giving psychotherapy simultaneously. I don't think you really have to do it quite that simultaneously, but that's what they did. Because you had a captive audience, so they were <laughs> delivering psychotherapy right there. And uh, remember what I said before, usual TMS response rate 50%, remission rate 33%. They got, with their com combination, it's in the quotes over on the lower right, a 66% response and a 56% respo 56 remission rate. That is huge. Um, that's really robust response and remission. And 60% of them sustained remission at follow-up, which was for six months. So, pretty good. The question of TMS monotherapy. So, the, um, there's one study that, that I know of that really sort of addressed this question. So they looked at Medicaid, so people who are receiving TMS have often not derived benefit from three, four, five, six, some of them 12 or 13 medications. So why use another medication? The patients don't want to use them. They only, only experience side effects. So they, in this study, uh, tried a TMS monotherapy. Uh, they had two cohorts. One would receive TMS after treatment, uh, and response would receive TMS on a monthly schedule, and the other they would observe and reintroduce TMS if they needed to. And what they got, these are the Kaplan-Meier curves. So OBS, the red dashed line, is for the ones who are just being observed, and SCH is for scheduled, who got TMS at monthly intervals after they initially responded. And uh, what they found was no statistically significant difference between those two strategies. Um, what I have done though, I, so I hacked this curve, okay? So I went to, okay, let's look at survival probability of 0.5 and sort of draw a horizontal line across, so we're hitting here. The, so, and the red line is for patients who are not getting any TMS until they decompensate, right? And then we drop down from that to here, and we're finding ourselves around maybe 150, 160 days. So, um, pretty much that's what I tell patients. If you try to just get TMS and then nothing else and not take any meds, uh, there's a 50% chance that you will relapse in about six months. And uh, there have been some other studies that have also looked at uh, the studies of TMS durability, and those patients would also tend to relapse within the first six months. So try to remember that as a number as well. And uh, the usual standard of treatment after TMS is monotherapy with a single antidepressant medication to maintain the benefit. Uh, lastly, the question of concomitant alcohol use. So we have no great data about this, but often it is thought that a, a glass of wine now and then might be benign. And there are two small studies that I'd just like to point out. One of them, uh, both of them are from the same group, Wolf Siemens group, they're in, based in Germany. And what they did was they, they used TMS as a research tool to either, to, to promote um, changes in neuroplasticity, and then they s tried to see what a low dose of alcohol equivalent to a glass of wine would do. And two things, Al the, the small dose of alcohol appeared to decrease long-term potentiation and it appeared to increase long-term depression. Now when we're doing TMS, what we're trying to do is connect a circuit and, and maintain um, 
a network of brain activity and we want that to endure. So at some level we need long-term potentiation to be occurring. And what seemed to be happening is that the alcohol was abolishing those effects. So whenever I have patients in TMS, I, I tell them that you know, you're, you're, it's a huge investment in terms of time and cost, and you're really not doing yourself any favors by drinking. If they really need a drink, okay, maybe Saturday night if we're doing Monday to Friday treatments because they don't have another treatment on Sunday, and there's been a bit of time for them to consolidate the treatment from Friday. But I would rather they not drink at all. Um, I'll stop there and invite questions from the audience and maybe questions from my colleagues. We can talk more about TMS. Thanks. So, any questions? Yes. Would the um, rule out include the ocular implants normally used for cataract surgery? Would those not? Would those preclude using the treatment? Right, so the question is, would ocular implants used in cataract surgery preclude receiving TMS? Um, so the device manufacturers always recommend contacting them and having them give you a specific answer. But if the implants did not contain any ferromagnetic material, then they should be safe. Um, one other thing the device manufacturers tend to say is they want nothing ferromagnetic within 30 centimeters of the coil. So if your coil's here, that's pretty much everything. Um, however, um, patients have kept on their earrings and had no problems. <laughs> uh, some patients I had would have actually um, earbuds in so they could listen to their um, iP iPod or phone. So, and nothing had the phone, the headphones didn't blow up or heat up. So, you know, <laughs> it's my own take. Yes, Benita. Um, what's the 30% time spent on? I was wondering about how many patients would that be per day that could be? It's about three patients a day. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Is there any um, studies uh, or suicide risk or you know, suicide attempts? Right. Great, great right question. Um, so the question is, have there been studies of TMS for suicide risk? So I believe Mark George looked at this question several years ago, um, and whether you could do TMS um, rapidly on an inpatient setting and decrease suicidal risk, and the answer is yes, suicide risk was decreased with acute TMS treatment. Um, but if you have an outpatient with conventional one treatment a day, then it's probably not safe to do that at all. That patient should be hospitalized. And on this slide I have here, you know, one of the things we've been talking about is TMS on um, adult inpatient. And uh, Catherine had also mentioned something called accelerated TMS, where like 10 treatments are done in a day. And those have been shown to rapidly improve depressive symptoms. So moving forward, there may be ways to get a rapid anti-suicidal effect. Yes, what, Shane. What's the reason for not focusing primarily on the rapid TMS, the accelerated one? Right, good question. So that's, that's rather new. Um, at Stanford, a colleague of ours, Nolan Williams, has really been pioneering that. So I mean, his publications on it are just about a year, the oldest is about a year old. Uh, so it's, it's a new idea. It's become possible using newer treatment protocols which shorten the duration of a treatment without losing benefit. So if you're trying to do 10, 30 minute treatments in a day, it would take really, really long. Um, and you need some time for consolidation of gains for long-term potentiation, which is about 45 minutes. So it would be impossible, but he's doing a three minute treatment and then about an hour break and then another three minute treatment. One of the big factors there is safety. Mm -hmm. um, there were guidelines published about seizure risk, and this kind of paradigm exceeded those guidelines. So for years, people were kind of hesitant to go across there. They, those guidelines, though, were extremely conservative, and I think this newer data shows that. The other is that it's, as we already mentioned, time. Uh, getting reimbursed for that time is also a very complicated issue. And, figuring out how to use the logistics of that as part. Well. Right, when I worked in the private sector, there was no way, absolutely no way that insurance would pay for more than one treatment in a day. So we had that 
limitation. Yes. I think um, I was in. I did a course with Alvaro. Uh -huh. and, um, there's some there's some evidence against that actually because um, because there's research suggesting that if you do um, successive TMS sessions within the within the same day, like with 10 hertz or above, that would actually decrease. It would actually cause LTD. So um, mm -hmm. evidence against that suggests that you know for daily built up facilitation, it has to be um, you know. Um, every 24 hours, but um, that's just common. But um, I had a question about, um, you know, the biotypes that yeah. you showed. Mm -hmm. um, I, was, I was just wondering um, if there's any research, I mean, how was that distinguished between responders and non-responders? Like, there seems to be clear response to biotype one. Right. If there's, you know what the... Sure, I, so the, and I really think there should be journal clubs all the time about that paper. But basically, they looked at the HAMD, and um, they and they looked at connectivity. And the one group was high anxiety, insomnia, and the connectivity associated with that. And the other group was anhedonia, and the connectivity associated with that. And uh, so, you, so you had both paper and pencil or symptom scores, as well as the connectivity, um, with their initial assumption that like high anxiety and, and insomnia is somehow different from um, that anhedonic group. And what they came up with was this spread into four distinct biotypes. And it's really interesting. So biotype one is high anxiety uh, and insomnia, but biotype three, which is also a responding biotype, is the complete opposite. They're anhedonic. And so you couldn't just with the HAMD um, parse out which was which and which patient you should treat with TMS. Yeah, um, so it's, it's a, and other groups might come up with some other set of markers that help distinguish, but that's what they did. And then they also did a replication data set, which is important in this kind of work. And uh, um, Andrew was talking about target being important. This group happened to target the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex, not the DLPFC. Um, probably because they're working with um, this Canadian group that tends to target Jonathan Downer's group, which tends to target the DMPFC. Yes, we, we actually work with uh, Frida Garajan, and so one of the things we're developing are algorithms like PPI, mm -hmm. to combine PPI with functional imaging and look at response, and predictors of response before and after TMS, which so would be, yeah. be great to turn you with these types of stuff. Thank you very much. Thanks for that question. Um, other questions? Yes, Dom? Uh, for the practitioners, with, is there any sense of uh, impatience with new devices in the pipeline from R&D to FDA approval? That probably takes a long time. And right. Like, really, yeah, what? Like, can move along more quickly or whatever? Right. So, um, I don't know if either of you want to add add to that. So I was at the brain stimulation meeting in Vancouver. And uh, there, so one of the things about the devices that are currently on the market is they all use a biphasic pulse. So the electrical current is going through the coil in a certain way, kind of, it's kind of like, it, it's kind of sinusoidal. And uh, um, they are looking at ways to change the physics of that so that you only have, you have monophasic pulses and that might do interesting things to to the stimulation so there's a company called rogue research that has a, a device where you can shape the the pulse and that might do very different things to the brain um, so that's that's one and it's research only though and basically it has to do with physics and how much energy it takes and the cost of building the the electronics to do that. Uh, and then I, I heard another talk from the Brainsway group. So they have the one that looks like a hairdryer helmet. And they have an idea to not only kind of, so the coil is static, it's fixed in place. And they want to 
basically make the magnetic field after they pulsed rotate, not by physically rotating the coil, but by changing like how they're pushing current through which wires. So to, because they're only maximally stimulating neurons in one particular plane that happens to be lined up right with the coil. So their idea is that if they can produce a rotating field, they can hit a lot more neurons. So what needs to happen is to see whether those ideas, which are really interesting and would be sort of like the next generations of the technology, will actually um, produce the benefits that we want. Any other questions? Yes. Just wondering, um, you mentioned the brain's way coil. What's your sense of the different it, pros and cons of right. the TMS? So um, the brain's way has this thing called the H coil. H stands for Hesed, which means hug in Hebrew, I believe. Um, and it kind of it wraps around the head, kind of does really hug your head. And uh, they trade off focality for depth. So it's way less focal than a figure of eight coil. Like when I put a figure of eight coil in my scalp, it feels like I'm hitting my head in a single point, whereas the brain's way feels more like a punch to the head. I also use that to explain it to patients and their eyes kind of blow, right? So it, it's a broader field. Um, whereas in regular TMS, nothing is supposed to move when you're pulsing a patient, except maybe the superficial muscles on the scalp. With the brain's way, it's not unusual for their hand to um, be jumping up, even both their hands, during treatment. And um, so that it, it's just hitting a lot more neurons. And uh, I have found that patients have responded rapidly to it, but what I'd like to see is a good head-to-head -head trial between the technologies. Um, it's also, at least theoretically, more likely that it would produce seizures more easily if it's stimulating more brain. Uh, and for work like what Andrew and Catherine are doing, I think that they're probably interested in focality um, and uh, delineating circuits. Two comments. Um, one, you know, Ramotzi mentioned that it, uh, what you feel on your head. It is like you're getting hit, but you're not actually being touched. It's actually that the magnetic field causes the muscles in the scalp to contract, and the net, net effect of the sound and that contraction makes it feel like you're actually getting hit on the head. <laughs> um, the other issue is that the, the, the depth um, is complicated. Breath I, makes sense, but the problem with depth is that we titrate our dosage to a fixed response in the cortical motor neuron. Once you've done that, you've pretty much fixed the depth, right? You, you're, you're, your field is now not going to extend deeper than that. Uh, and, and so no matter what the capability is, we're dosing in a way that standardizes depth. But breath, the brain sway one, is clearly much, 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 much broader. Any other questions? Yeah. Have you had any experience with the H7 coil for OCD? Um, I, no. So that coil arrived just as I was leaving the place I was at before. Um, so I've talked to colleagues about it. Um, I've looked at the field diagrams also. So it's getting a lot deeper, especially anteriorly, um, based on the information on Rainsway's website. Um, and th that, that coil is for, you're talking about the OCD? Right. Right, the OCD treatment coil. Um, I think one, just OCD is complex. Uh, some circuits need to, you need to activate them first and then fire an inhibitory pulse, whereas others it may be appropriate for resting state stimulation. And so you really have to think of your specific patient's OCD and then how you're going to target it. Um, so I, I leave it to the OCD experts to, <laughs> to, to deal with OCD. It's not simply just putting them under the coil. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, look forward to the TMS service starting at UCSF.